begin. Namo tassa pegawato arahato sama sambudasa. Namo tassa pegawato arahato sama sambudasa. Namo tassa pegawato arahato sama sambudasa. So, I think there's a, a few new people here, so, or people I'm not too familiar with, so I'll introduce myself. My name is Ferox. I am a 33-year-old lay Buddhist disciple of the Theravada tradition. <clears throat> and that means that I'm just a regular guy. I'm not a monastic. I'm not a monk. I'm not a master. I'm not a guru. I'm just a, a Dhamma friend, a person who is on his path. So what we usually do here is uh, we have a little talk. Um, I usually talk for about... 20 minutes to a half hour about a topic and uh, we discuss the topic we have a full hour for uh, the talk and the discussion um, usually it's customary when uh, a monk does a talk that you hold off your questions to the end uh, since I'm not a monk and since I don't necessarily prefer that uh, you can feel free to um, talk, ask questions comment as the talk is going on so never feel uh, worried that you might interrupt anything if you want to make a comment or ask a question. <clears throat> so today uh, I wanted to talk about a couple different topics all in one. Uh, my life has been really, really uh, what I would call challenging lately. <laughs> And it's really start. It's really been putting my uh, my Buddhist training to the test. So I wanted to talk a little bit about today, uh, talking about dealing with difficult times in life, uh, expectations about uh, you know things in life, um, and uh, how to deal with that, and having a little faith. And before the the bell rings, ding, 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 when I say faith, I'll discuss what we mean by when we talk about faith. So, <clears throat> a lot of times, uh, in Buddhist circles, and in just New Age and, and psychological stuff today, we talk about having positive thought, or having a positive outlook towards things in life. And I... Uh, <clears throat> I got to a point, I would say probably about two years ago, where I decided that I was going to be positive no matter what. Come hell or high water, I was going to be positive. And I thought about uh, how I would do that, and, and knowing uh, at the time I um, wasn't heavily into my Buddhist training like I am now but I was getting there, and I noted, I realized that I had to change my habits, I had to change my mindset to truly bring about that positive thinking. And one of the, th the, the things that I decided to do uh, <clears throat> was I developed, a, I guess, what you would call a mantra. And it was what I, I called it the positive thought mantra. And I started saying it every day. And it started out, let me see if I can remember it. I still say it, but I say it um, in more of a, a Buddhist perspective kind of way now these days. I would say, uh, I'm trying to remember, now that I have to actually remember it, <laughs> I've said it so many times over the years. So I say it would go, I know that through positive thought, and positive frame of mind that today will be a good day that tomorrow will be a good day that this week will be a good week that this month will be a good month and this year will be a good year and it, it almost like it sounds kinda silly doesn't it I, I don't know if you guys who are older or about my age and you might have watched Saturday Night Live and they had this one guy Stuart Handy who would look in front of a mirror and say I'm good enough I'm smart enough and people like me you know <laughs> it sounds kinda like corny like who who is actually yeah Stuart Smalley that's it <laughs> like who's actually gonna gonna say these silly things every day but <clears throat> 
it's funny that when you really when you start to do that and you're changing your your habitual mind states and you say no matter what you say okay I'm saying this and you don't even necessarily have to fight to try to think positive you're you're changing your mind you're trying to change your subconscious and in doing so over time things start to change and it's weird that I started noticing that when I started to change my mindset and when I started to react to situations in a positive manner, things started going better in my life. And it wasn't anything hugely major. It's not like, you know, overnight I was rich and famous and all this stuff because I'm not. But <laughs> just the things how things that you kind of think you go into work and you're like, oh, I know it's going to be you know, th this is what usually happens in this situation, so it's going to be a really horrible day at work. But if you, in the morning, and you say the positive thought mantra, setting off that day with positive thought, at the end of the day, you're like, wow, it went pretty good. It's almost like you, in your mind, you created your day. In a way, it's almost kind of like matrixy or something. <laughs> but just, and, and it's not necessarily that you shaped the world around you. It's that your attitude and your choices and your decisions during that day while thinking positive was part of a cause and effect, was part of karma, which was is your actions created a more beneficial day for you. So, as I was going on, I add I added more to the positive thought mantra. <clears throat> I would say that I know that this uh, that I will ha have a good day, and I know that thinking positive and having a positive frame of mind leads to a more beneficial life. So now I say. Now I, um, when I do the thought mantra, I say that, you know, today will be a good day, tomorrow will be a good day. And I said, I know that no matter what karmic causes and effects happen, through positive thought, through positive mind frames, and through skillful actions, I will create a more beneficial life for myself and those around me. So it's basically the same thing but it's just ta adding in karma and cause and effect. So that leads to, you start to develop a little bit of a faith. You, you kind of have faith that you know that even in hard times, <clears throat> if you start to think positive, if you catch yourself and stop that negativity and you start to think positive, you know, even, you, you might not know how it's going to get better, but you start to know, you start to have faith that it will get better. I'm reading a, uh, a great book um, on meditation called, uh, Welcome Asia. Uh, the book is called um, Oy, Mindfulness in Plain English by uh, Bhante Gunaratana. And he talks about faith in there. And what he says faith, faith as we normally think it is believing in something uh, that we can't see, that we can't experience. But faith in terms of a Buddhist perspective is exactly what I described. I started to see that my, that changing my mindset actually created a more beneficial life for myself. And I have faith that even in the darkest times, if I think positive, that my life will become more beneficial. My, those of you, some of you know what I do. Um, for those of you who don't, I do child protective services. Uh, and the last month for me has been, well, I usually call it insanely nightmarish. <laughs> but uh, one of the, in thinking positively about uh, a week or two ago, I decided to say, from now on, nothing is insanely nightmarish. It's just challenging. And it's, uh, it's kind of ironic because 
uh, in uh, Bonte Gunaratana's book, he says, that's one of the first things he says, and I read this after I decided to change it, and he says, from now on, look at things that happen in life as challenges to grow, not as bad things that happen. <clears throat> uh, Bonte, uh, uh, Ajahn Brahm, who some of you may know, uh, would talk about shit for your garden, and excuse my cursing, but he says it too, so <laughs> if the monk can say it, then I can say it. <laughs> And he says, what do you do with the shit of life? You put it in your garden so you can grow beautiful flowers. So it's all about taking, no matter how bad things are getting, it's all about being able to control your mindset. And, and you might, <clears throat> if, if you're really at the beginning of your meditation practice, you might kind of not see how that can actually work. But, you know, for those of you who've heard me talk before in the past, I talk about how as you get into your meditation practice, you start to see your, um, the processes of the mind. You start to see, instead of just saying something and not knowing why you said it, you start to see the six or seven or eight or ten mental processes that led to why you said that. So, uh, likewise when the world is falling apart around you as it was as it has been for me for the last uh, week or so and you start to notice you get into these negative mind frames and negative mindsets and you start to have despair and you know i'm no i'm certainly like i said i'm no buddhist master and i don't even think a buddhist master would be nobody except for somebody who's enlightened would not have these despair these feelings but the key is <clears throat> to be able to to see that and to go back to your mindset. Like I was in court today and uh, for my job, and I've been feeling sick and a lot of stuff, and I'm behind on work because of all these emergencies that have been happening. And in just court and just sitting there, while I was starting to feel all of these things, all of this stuff in life piling on top of me, I just closed my eyes and just was at peace in the moment. And I just said, here I am, here now I am sitting. And I just sat there. And everything, all of that stuff that was piling on, <laughs> lifted. And it was gone. And I thought back to my faith. <clears throat> my faith in that my mindset creates my day and I went back to that and everything turned out pretty good <laughs> I actually got to get to go home uh, for uh, two hours early because I'm starting to get sick so hey it got me out of work and everything went fine so it's all about changing your mind everything Buddhism meditation that's what it's all about it's about changing your mindset changing your habitual tendencies and our habitual tendencies that we've been raised um, raised up culturally that we physio physiologically have you know our the human body has had the human mind has had throughout evolution cause us to have these worries to have these this uh, fault finding mind see oh, all these negative all these negative things that happen and like I said it's one of those things where in the beginning you almost kind of have to have what we would consider real faith not Buddhist faith but real faith you kind of have to know that it'll work even if you haven't seen it work and then once you've seen it work there's the there's no doubt. You know that that's how it works. That's what they talk about in the suttas. They talk about how those, uh, how people, once you get to a certain point, you have no doubts about the Dharma and about the Buddha. Obviously, I'm not up to that point yet, but I'm to a point where I can see that there is, I do have some faith in this. And faith as in I've seen it that it, I've seen and I know that it works not that I'm just believing that it works 
leap of faith in that it is it's been done before and I know that <clears throat> I can do it again so even in the, the roughest times you have the ability to choose you can let yourself you can let your mind fall down into these negative mind states and just make things worse you can continue to allow yourself to destroy your life or you have the choice to change you really do have that choice even though you might not see it right now but you do one of the things that uh, dealing I guess a little bit with uncertainty in life Ajahn Brahm uh, in one of his talks said a great saying that I've kinda adopted and the saying is don't ask from life what it cannot give and it's a great saying in terms of don't expect things in life a lot of times what we expect most of the time it it happens in some way different you expect to go to work today and you expect to go home at five o'clock but if you have my job and it's a friday night you expect to go home at five but then you're out till ten o'clock at night doing emergencies <laughs> and you didn't know about you didn't know you were going to do emergencies until about four thirty that afternoon but then the emergencies came so <clears throat> whatever you expect it will always be different so part of having that positive mindset is not necessarily expecting anything if you're just in the moment you're not expecting if you're staying in the present and, we, and I've talked about the present and the, the future and the past before in Buddhism in meditation we're trying to be in the present mindfulness in the present and when we're in the present we're not worried about the future we're not pining over the past with regrets we're just there in the present and whatever happens in that moment we deal with as it comes along in that moment so no matter what happens we have the choice of what to do with that and we have the choice we always have the choice there's always something that we can do we don't want to worry about the future but we want to be in that present and making decisions in that present for that present it's so it's funny that how I talked a little bit about creating your own world <clears throat> that um, when, when I, I'll, I'll just uh, preface it in terms of, in our caseload, we have what's called placement cases, and that's a, a case where the child has been removed by the state, So, which is a, a pretty complicated case. And <clears throat> I was just saying on Friday how I think I could use some more placement cases. So I like the placement cases because it's all court involved and things go a little easier sometimes. Well, guess what? Lo and behold, five hours later, I'm removing a, a child and I have a, a placement case so I created through expectations in a way my own my own challenge I won't call it a nightmare I'll call it a challenge <laughs> so it's amazing when you see you you see that <clears throat> you see that thinking positive creates a more beneficial life for yourself but then you also see how thinking negative or having expectations creates the opposite it creates a more challenging life it creates the more negativity and that's something that you have the choice like I said you always have the choice you're not worrying about oh the future this or that like the, the, I have I'll talk about some one of my worries I think about a lot like when I do my meditation I almost feel and it, it, and I think to myself why do I think this way or but I think I'm like I'm sitting here talking to what 15 of you and I almost have a little bit of an inferiority complex in that like I said I'm not a monk and I don't want to necessarily lead anybody astray and I think to myself well I better get I get I better get some more insight through meditation so that I, you know I can 
be a, a better teacher or whatever. And I think to myself, I'm already creating. I'm creating expectations and setting myself up for for failure in a way. Whereas all the insights I ever had came from just letting go, being at peace, and not trying to do anything. So you see there that <clears throat> even though my first inclinations through that mind, that fault-finding mind, is all this negative stuff about me being a teacher... And where is it going to get me? It's just going to lead me to frustrations and trying to meditate. Whereas letting go, no expectations, no worries. And you have a good meditation. Or you have a good talk. Or you have a good day. When you have that, when you see that it works, you start to develop that faith. And that's important. So remember the positive thought mantra. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. All it is 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 a daily training to start to change your mindset. And that's really what meditation is. <clears throat> meditation is changing your old habits, going against the flow. The normal flow is our fault-finding mind, our negativity, our worry about the future our regrets of the past. When you follow the Dhamma, when you follow the Buddhist path, you're going against the flow. No regrets of the past, no worries of the future, no expectations, just in the present moment. And whatever you have in front of you in the present moment, you deal with in the present moment, not worrying about the future. So remember, positive thought mantra, and also, nothing is bad in life, it's just a challenge. <laughs> it's just a, a, a new way for us to to learn. I, I learned a new one from Ajahn Brahm, one of the new videos, which I liked. He, uh, <clears throat> he said that the stop signs in life are the Dharma. The Dharma is, is staring you right in the face. So when you see, when you're driving and you see a stop sign, it's the Dhamma, it's the Buddha telling you to slow down, to be in the moment, to know Dhamma. <laughs> so, I think uh, that is the end of the talk, or coming close to it. Yes, I love it too. <clears throat> I love it too. Because it is, you have to... You, you have to slow down. You, you can't, if you just go along, if you just allow yourself to be dragged along by the currents, you're not going to get anywhere. You're going you're gonna to get somewhere and you're going to wonder, how the heck did I get there? And why didn't I know? <laughs> it's kind of like when, uh, when you were younger and you got drunk and then you like woke up somewhere and you're like, how did I get here? Oh, I wasn't paying attention. I wasn't mindful. <laughs> <clears throat> so any uh, comments or questions or anything at this point? The only real advice that I can give is that it, like I said before, for me it's a truth. For me it's faith because I've seen it. I know that it works. For you it might not be that, but it can be. And the only way to do that is to start changing your mindset through the meditation through stuff like the positive thought mantra you don't have to do exactly what I say in terms of you know you come up with your own it's all about doing a daily practice of changing your mind Taking a few seconds out when you're in class. Yep. Well, Denise, that's um. Were, were you around on Sunday when we when we uh, at the Sutta discussion, or uh, 
when we read about how the Buddhas, um, the five ways of. Oh no, when we were do, we were in the uh, the class when we were going over right speech, and uh, what the the Buddha gave five or six ways of when we should speak, or what we should do before we speak. So that's uh, that's good practice, especially when you're dealing with children, and uh, I've. Uh, I've never been a, a teacher teacher, but I've been a substitute, and I'm actually certified to teach history, but it just never panned out. So I know how it is being in front of 30 kids that are 30 uh, 7th and 8th graders that are going nuts, <laughs> and you have to worry about covering your butt and doing what you, you know, not getting in trouble and all that stuff. So yeah, taking a, a few seconds to um, to kind of bring yourself to peace and, and think about you know, get in the moment and dealing in the moment. Um, you know, that makes a huge difference. Hey, <clears throat> as long as they're not killing each other, what's a few more seconds of, of them being yelling and loud, right? <laughs> I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. You know, I, it's so funny because I always, I remember that and I always laughed at it and, and always like thought it was funny. But there was a, a time in my life where I, uh, when I was a teenager, actually, a late teen, and I decided that I didn't want to be this introverted type person that I, I always was through high school, like a negative introverted kind of person. And I actually started like, um, what I started to do was I started the whole thing. Somebody had told me, and I, I didn't really know too much about Buddhism back then, but it kind of fits in. Somebody is telling me that, uh, I forgot where I learned it, but to start smiling even if you're not even if you don't you're not happy just start smiling and people will smile back at you and it, it'll change everything and so I started doing that and I also started looking at myself in the mirror and I started saying stuff I didn't say I'm good enough I'm smart enough that God of people like me but <laughs> I forgot what I said but I changed you know I became like a, a more extroverted person and look I mean now I can do public speaking and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. I uh I not only talk to you guys, but I'm also fairly involved politically uh in my state, so I do political talks as well. So but public speaking has always been something that I haven't been too afraid of. I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm not worried about it. <clears throat> smile all the time. Well you know I don't actually I don't necessarily just smile all the time now. But I just have like a, I guess what you would call a flat affect in that I just, I'm not smiling and I'm not like looking all mean. But um, I guess the natural inclination of, of my lips is to kind of like go downward. So people are always like, oh, what's wrong? Are you okay? <laughs> like, no, I'm fine. I could be like in, in you know, total peace uh, inside. But because of the way I guess physically I look, they think that I'm like angry or mad or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> they see me outside meditating enough, they should know that I'm probably not angry and mad all the time. But <clears throat> anyways, let's see. Did I look anything? Yep. That's because the Buddha would say there is no good and bad. There is just action and reaction. We we attribute actions as good or bad based on if we have an attraction or aversion to them. We meet a, we meet a girl or a boy. We are attracted to them. Ooh, it's good. They cheat on us or something like that, or they die, or whatever, there's a version. Ah, oh, that sucks. <clears throat> and that's where we get good and bad. It's all uh, just action. Without judgment. Well, that's, you know, that's something that I've, uh, I took a long time to learn in terms of our meditation practice. You're not, you shouldn't, you're not supposed to have any judgment when you're, you're just observing in your meditation practice. And I used to have, in the beginning, I used to have a lot of judgment in meditation because I always, you know, read a, I, I, kind of like the person who 
like always followed directions and stuff. So I, I read and you know, okay, I'm supposed to sit this way. I'm supposed to you know pay attention to the breathing. I'm supposed to do this and that. And then it wasn't going the way I I thought it was supposed to go, and I would get angry. And I I mean I got to the point where I was so frustrated with meditation that I I didn't do it for like a year and a half. <laughs> and then I started um, finding like videos from Ajahn Brahm and 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 learning from other monastics and and they all have at least in my tradition I mean obviously I've go from the Theravada tradition so my perspective is from Theravada and they all have this the same concept of no judgment letting go being at peace just observing whatever happens if you have if you're in meditation and you have a thought about I don't know a, a sexy thought about some male or female or whatever, that's fine. If you're in meditation and you have a thought of you want to kill somebody, <laughs> it's just a thought. It doesn't matter. It's just a phenomena. You don't want to attach to it either way. You just observe it. And you observe it arising. You observe it uh, climaxing. And you observe it disappearing. Those three things. And that's something that I'm trying to work on myself. That's definitely something that's not easy. But supposedly, especially in uh, Vipassana meditation, as you really get to become sensitive to see these things, you'll easily see when things arise, when things climax, or when things... Yeah. I do that now like when I'm... Or I do that with my itching. Or with my pain and stuff like that. I, I had my I had a five day retreat and my back was killing me. This, this is going back to September, and I I had never done six hours of meditation in a day, so I was just in all kinds of agony. And <laughs> in one of my in one of my interviews with one of the monastics, he said, "Pain is just a um, a condition. Take it as a med as a meditation uh, point and observe it. Observe it come." Uh, observe it, uh, observe it as it's most painful, and then observe it go away. And so I'm sitting there, I'm like, okay, here comes the pain, here comes the, oh, it's getting more painful, it's getting more painful, okay, when the heck is it going away? <laughs> and then I'm like, I have to move, I'm like, ah, oh, okay, there, it went away because I moved, yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a lot to learn and a long way to go, we all do. <laughs> But we're all we're all uh, Dhamma friends, Dhamma brothers and sisters, all on the same path. Even if you don't know it, they always say all every book on meditation you see, no matter what, they they always say that meditation is not easy. Buddhism is not easy. If it was, more people would be into it. <laughs> Meditation takes time, dedication, and and regularity, really. It's just like anything. It's just like a habit that you're trying to develop, a positive habit. Patience. Yeah, yeah Delani, the same thing uh, in the temples and places that I've been to as well. When you, when you really find... I, I found in my experience that there really is... Even not only just in our our thoughts and our minds, but <clears throat> there's no judgment. Like I've never seen a monk put a judgment on anybody. You know, even if it's stuff like like Westerners, like people who grew up in Sri Lanka and stuff, they know like, oh, you're not supposed to point your feet at the Buddha or whatever. So you know, like that's just really in all actuality, it's just a cultural thing that it's kind of like a silly superstition. But you know, that <clears throat> people from those cultures take it very seriously. And you'll you'll see like Westerners most of the time, if a Westerner is like oh like their their feet are in pain and they have their legs out, you're not gonna see a monk like come at them with a stick and like oh you're you know you you don't see that you know so it's okay if you need to get up and walk you you don't if you sit down in, on the mat the, to meditate if you have to get up and go you get up and go the the monk's not gonna open his eyes for meditation and say where are you going get back on that mat. They're not going to do that. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. At least in, I mean, see, I don't know too much about Zen, so any any kind of 
comment I make through Zen is is just kind of uh, stereotyping and 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 not full knowledge. But like a, I don't know. Like Delani might be able to know more about the whole. You know, I know that, uh, or at least I've seen that monks will go and like if you're slouching, they'll have a stick and they'll whack you a little bit or something like that. But I don't know. Like I've never been to a Zen monastery or anything like that, so I can't really speak from experience. But at least in the Theravada tradition that I've experienced, it's always been that the monks are, you know, they're not going to yell at you for what for uh, for not bowing at the monk or anything like that. It's all peace. It's all there's no judgment. <clears throat> Much met to Ajitar. Good to see you. Thanks for coming. So yeah, I mean, with anything with Buddhism, there is no. Ajahn Brahm said something that to me that was very um, poignant. And something that somebody coming from the Catholic faith, uh, a Catholic upbringing, <clears throat> is, is almost kind of like giving me permission. And uh, he said, there is no such thing as guilt in Buddhism. And I thought about that and I said, you know what? That's great. <laughs> that That's really great. I mean, and, and, and going into, go and, and that statement to me has been proven by my experience of going dealing with Buddhists dealing with monks there really is no such thing as guilt there's no such thing as being looked down upon and if there is I would uh, I would definitely question that place that you're at <laughs> I would definitely question that because uh, I've been to multiple places of, of multiple sects of Buddhism, including Mahayana and Theravada, and <clears throat> a lot of that to me is, is a lot. My experience, it's all the same. I had the, the only the only uh, thing that I guess somebody might consider mean uh, that a monk ever said to me was the first time I went to um, the monastery uh, up north. Uh, I was, uh, those of you, some of you might know that I recently lost a lot of weight. I had some weight loss surgery. And the, the old abbot, the, the master abbot at this monastery, who had to be at the time, he's passed away now, but at the time he, he probably was like 93, 94. And he's like this little like Yoda kind of character guy who's like this little hunched over old man who would like shuffle along. And <clears throat> he was he walked past me and he smiled and he looked at me and he says you are very fat and all I could do was just start laughing my ass off. <laughs> you could tell there was no there was no um, malice behind it I mean I, I don't necessarily know what he was trying to get at um, maybe he was just pointing the obvious but it could have been <laughs> but I just it, it was just something that like you know that in any other uh, part of society, that would have been like such a negative thing uh, between people. But here I am with with this old wise master, and he says that, and it's just like, just cracks me up. I don't know. So I'll always, I think I'll always remember that that little interaction till my dying day, because it's technically my real, my really first interaction with a monk. <laughs> so. <clears throat> Good to see you again, Synergy. It's been a while since I saw you. So, it's always good to see some old friends, old Dhamma friends. No problem. It's getting close to that time anyway. Unless there's any further uh, questions or comments, we can end it here. <clears throat>